good morning and uh, happy Friday. Natasha Gatson is our speaker today. And it's really, really a wonderful uh, pleasure for me to be able to introduce her to you. I think the wonderful thing about these uh, GNI Grand Rounds are that we get to uh, introduce to our community uh, here in Philadelphia, both our clinical community and also our academic partners like at Drexel, uh, folks that are just really a wonderfully high caliber. But in this instance, it's also somebody that's a, a really good friend of mine. And so I find that uh, equally uh, just uh, exciting. I'm not going to go into too much uh, of Natasha's background because any of you can just simply uh, Google that, but she is a product of the Midwest. Uh, her undergraduate was at Indiana University. And then I did, I guess I didn't realize this because I was at Ohio State uh, for several years, but Natasha was there for 15 years, uh, getting her MD and her PhD, and then ultimately also doing an NIH uh, funded and sponsored fellowship also at Ohio State University with uh, Nino Kioka. And if any of you do know anything about neuro-oncology, Dr. Kioka is really one of the global leaders for neuro-oncology and in particular vaccine research. After being at Ohio State for 15 years, clearly a hankering for barbecue sent her down to Texas. And she went to one of the premier neuro-oncology programs at MD Anderson. And then after that, that's when I had a chance to start uh, really interacting with Natasha when we were both at Geisinger Medical Center. And I would say that my interactions there were about some of the best, you know, neuro-oncology patients are special. They have horrible diseases and uh, keeping them motivated and keeping the team motivated is the key to their longevity and success. And I think Natasha is a champion of that. And I think that is one of her greatest assets, not only her intellect, but her passion for her patients. You can see uh, on her slide up here that there are a bunch of different logos, but right now, uh, even though she's in Arizona, she's getting ready to transition to be the senior medical director of neuro-oncology and the uh, Neuro-Oncology Center of Excellence at Indiana University, where she is a full professor. Um, you know, Natasha, uh, there are so many other aspects and facets to you as a, as a mom, as a kickboxer, as uh, somebody who uh, has a wide range of interests, but I'll leave it to you to tell us about leptomeningeal disease and thank you for waking up so early. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm going to cut the uh, camera off though now, so I would be able to uh, just focus a bit here. All right. So I'm going to be able, and thank you again uh, for uh, the introduction, Adam. You really are a very special person. You guys have to know for me to get up at 4:30 with. <laughs> Uh, so I want to review three cases, which is really going to be where I introduce some of the um, diagnostic and uh, management things. Really important to see some of the presentation symptoms. And I grabbed these three cases from across the span of uh, places that I've been, uh, starting with Geisinger. I'm going to outline some of the innovative treatment and surveillance approaches, and then discuss uh, some of the diagnostic and pathophysiologic things toward the end, really kind of wrapping it up. There is not a lot uh, of uh, actual set in stone treatment or standards of treatment in leptomeningeal disease. And still it's a very, uh, it's a terrible diagnosis, mostly because people don't uh, understand the uh, steps that we need to take in treatment. And a lot of patients are excluded from clinical trials, for example, when they have this diagnosis. So we really don't know a lot about how these patients might respond if given effective treatment systemically. So the first case was a young lady um, who came in and I just copied this directly from her note. She had been uh, sent to chiropractors, put on lots of steroids, opioids, mostly just because her back pain. She presented with her mom uh, to this particular visit uh, at Geisinger where unfortunately she um, needed some more advocacy. Somebody else had to sort of speak up for her. Uh, she At this visit, she noted that she had found a mass in her breast, and it's important to note that the guideline for evaluating women, uh, regular women from year to year, is not to do a self-breast exam. Apparently, it causes hysteria, and lots of money is spent on MRIs chasing down fibrous uh, tissue that's not uh, tumor. But most of the patients that I see are indeed 
uh, found, they find their own uh, breast cancers with self breast exam. So um, she basically went on to have that biopsy and they found that it was a triple negative breast cancer. She did not uh, have the BRCA gene mutation also being a mom. Uh, but they did show diffuse uh, METs throughout her body. She started systemic chemotherapy. Um, they did, uh, again, the guideline does not note that you have to get an MRI of the brain at the time of uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. Indeed, it does go to the brain late uh, after the disease is, um, uh, or in the late stages of the disease. But I would argue at this point when she was found, it was already systemic. You would have thought she would have gotten a brain MRI. Uh, her brain MRI was normal after the chemotherapy, and they said their pain was controlled in the note. And uh, you can see here her PET scan did demonstrate a great response. Mm -hmm. By May 15th, however, she was having numbness, tingling, and leg twitching, and they knew what that was. That was just neuropathy, and they put her on Neurontin. Uh, by 21st, just six days later, she was in the ER in status epilepticus. This is what her MRI looked like, and you can see the Sickergus coating all throughout the posterior fossa and all these miliary disease just spread throughout parenchyma of the brain. Of course, she was no longer ambulatory in status. Uh, they treated the seizures and called neurology <clears throat> to evaluate the patient. Um, at that time, I was there and we had already put in place, um, Adam and I worked very closely together to take these patients immediately for whole brain radiation therapy. I typically, um, with the team, do 10 uh, to 20 gray, uh, and we do that in either five days or 10 days, and um, the, placing the Omeyer Reservoir immediately after, uh, we're within a day, so this is all during the immediate inpatient stay and uh, intrathecal chemotherapy. Uh, there's about seven different things we can deliver into the Omeya, uh for these patients. Uh, so you can see within a very short period of her uh, treatment, we were able to appreciate all these white, I'm sorry, all the little pink dots you see there are, those are all leptomeningeal disease spread. Here was what was left over those two areas in the uh, posterior fossa. We were able to treat those with uh, uh, stereotactic uh, radiation even after the um, whole brain. And you can see the Omaya placement there. So the patient just had that residual disease, and that's how we went on to treat her. She had interval gait improvement. We treated her seizures. Um, the pain was gone, leptomeningeal. Carcin carcinomatosis was 100% uh, um, cleared from her brain as far as looking at the CSF. We returned her to her decisional capacity. Remember when I met her, she doesn't recall meeting me. It was her family that made the decision that if we were going to go hospice, which is typically what they talk about, especially back in uh, 2016, uh, when this patient presented, th they were ready to go hospice. They had been convinced to do that. And uh, fortunately, uh, I had already started there and started to talk a little bit about, if you're willing to accept hospice, let's see about whether or not whole brain radiation, which could be even considered palliative for her, and um, uh, an evaluation of her um, um, after getting some intrathecal chemotherapy, we were able to improve her quality and longevity. However, she had been determined not to be suitable for any of the clinical trials that had some promising uh, drugs for her breast cancer uh, because of her diagnosis of leptomeningeal disease. She later presented to the uh, ED with difficulty breathing. We thought that maybe she had had a PE and indeed they could not find a PE, but this decreased filling uh, effect noted uh, in her IBC. They ultimately noted multiple other areas in her body that had uh, issues with uh, contrast filling, and they determined this was tumor microemboli syndrome, where in fact her tumor itself shattered into a bunch of pieces uh, and ended up uh, clotting off, causing end organ damage. In her case here, there was the, the guidelines to not do the MRI of the brain up front, which I would argue that that still could have been done and even of the spine since she was having all that back pain uh, right up front. But then also too, the, nobody wants uh, folks doing the self-breast exam. So some of those guidelines got in the way in health literacy. There was a delay to detecting the breast cancer because of these guidelines, as well as detecting the leptomeningeal disease. And the fact that she was excluded from clinical trials. Um, we are in the process right now of gathering 
those 182 patients between Geisinger and now uh, Banner and D. Anderson to show that we have been able to extend survival. And I'll show you some of those um, metrics, but basically being able to extend survival with the use of intrathecal chemotherapy and this whole brain radiation approach so that patients can get on to uh, clinical trials. That would be the goal here. So in the second case, there was a 58-year-old male business owner, very functional, highly functional, presented to the ED, even presenting to the ED with altered mentation. His KPS was still about 80. He had some gait instability, some difficulty, some confusion here and there. But he made the mistake in rule. Uh, he made the mistake of um, stating in, I'm sure, a question to uh, some residents that he had been to Mexico a month ago, and he did have this history of prostate cancer. This was his MRI, and for sure, nobody believed he had prostate cancer go to the brain, but indeed, he had been to Mexico a month ago. Uh, unfortunately, the differential diagnosis was number one and two, neurocysticercosis and uh, neuroinfectious disease. For many of you who understand Mexico one month ago, whether you ate, you know, raw pork or not, uh, the idea was that it would not show up this profound in one month. And so unfortunately, that was the um, leading diagnosis. They called, uh, they may have contacted somebody in, uh, in, in neurosurgery. We don't really know. Um, I, there's no uh, consult in the chart, but they did say this could be a METS here, but this is not his, of course, his pathology. This is what they suspected that was there. Unfortunately, there was an unclear plan in the note of for the patient to follow up with infectious disease and neurosurgery uh, on discharge. So he presented to the ED, and you can see I was already gone from um, Geisinger at this time. And uh, he presented to the ED in February. I just cut off the uh, year here. And this was his MRI at that time that he presented. He actually was never able to follow back up. And well, he didn't follow through with any of whatever plan they had, but they did discharge him. One month later, uh, not a full month later, he was uh, back in the ED and this is his new MRI. This time he's in status epilepticus uh, ultimately and uh, cannot, had to be brought into the ambulance, uh, but walked out. So uh, at this point, it, within a day or two, he was presented in the tumor board, and I happened to be there to hear the case. I had just landed here um, in January of this year. Uh, and so there was still concern going on with this neurocysticercosis, and they were going to do a biopsy. Now, I agreed to do the, the, you know, let's go ahead and do the biopsy, but my concern was for his history of prostate cancer. Yes, it rarely happens that it goes to the brain, but that's what he does have. And his disease in the body did not seem to be worse. And that was a bit confusing, but we said, you know, there could be this situation where it's neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So a small cell prostate cancer does have a high uh, tendency to go uh, to the brain. His, uh, like I said, systemic disease was, uh, there's no evidence of that. And so, um, they did the biopsy, saw that there was no worm, you know, there. And indeed, it was just the prostate cancer. So they talked about hospice for him. And I said, well, no, he walked in to the ED and you, you let him walk out. So we have to initiate treatment. We started the treatment and about four weeks in. So he got the whole brain radiation and then he started intrathecal therapy. So this is all happening in the hospital. So you can imagine uh, the money, the dollars are just racking up and he's sitting there. But again, you know, this hospice discussion pops up. And I said, remember, this is a gentleman that walked in just fine and could have had some things done immediately. And now we're, we're, we're at the point where we're at now. We have to continue to at least try to see this patient get better. About four weeks in, I would see that he could start to uh, grimace to some pain in the, uh, in the toes. And eventually, uh, by about uh, five weeks or so, he was localizing that pain and even withdrawing his foot. At about six weeks of treatment on his uh, intrathecal chemotherapy, he was able to open his eyes and start to react to get a lot of uh, uh, evidence of the brain sort of waking up. And uh, his first words were, 
you know, where have I been? What's been going on? And he didn't know how long he had been there. This was the picture of his brain at that time. And so you can see it had been just um, about a month and a couple of weeks. So because he did not have any evidence of uh, disease uh, showing up in his body, I had a terrible time trying to convince his systemic uh, treatment, a medical oncologist that these cells of the prostate don't just reside in the brain, they're coming from somewhere. And the fact that I cannot keep them under control by just giving the intrathecal chemotherapy means that there's a spigot that we need to turn off that's dripping these back into the brain. And so of course, it wasn't until he progressed again off of systemic therapy that I could get them to restart the chemotherapy in the body. I kept the push going for this particular patient only because I felt like there was a miss in the beginning and we really owed this family. And, you know, this is a man that now is talking again. He didn't necessarily return to work, but he was very uh, functional, uh, able to get up, walk, it, it walked into all of his clinic visits. But you notice now some of this motion artifact here. This is, you know, uh, a sign of him getting worse. And I'm sure, I, I mean, I kept the, the treatment with um uh, AEDs and all those things, but it was a constant fight with the medical oncologist to keep him on systemic therapy. So they started that and uh, we were able to get the disease again under uh, great control. And you can see this is just a month and 10 days later uh, back on the systemic therapy and continuing the IT uh, treatment. So looking at this durable response, you can see that this was his beginning um, after he had progressed after being discharged from the ED. This is his brain around uh, just eight uh, months or so after uh, treatment initiation. Another uh, four or so months later, here he is again, you know, still looking good, but the I noticed that he was still a little more wobbly and you could tell again here, he's some, some motion artifact again. And uh, I reached out to his uh, medical oncologist only to find that they decided that since his disease had been stable in the body and they can't seem to find those cells at the prostate, that he must be doing okay. And they stopped the systemic therapy. Three months later, this is his MRI. And you could barely make heads or tails of it, uh, but you can see that his disease had returned. Uh, it's futile to continue any IT chemotherapy when there's no systemic uh, approach. Uh, and again, they were surprised that these cells would show up in the brain. And uh, over and over again, I had the argument that this is a brain disease. This, this is his, you know, this is a neuro oncology situation, and you have to uh, just treat the brain. Never mind the fact that prostate is floating around in the brain, and so it was a it was a tough situation. I um, had to um, sort of uh, explain to the family, and by this time they were very sort of uh, tired of the whole thing, and he uh, succumbed to his disease off systemic therapy. Again, the issues here were early discharge from the ED without a good plan. Uh, the presumption of a primary infectious disease uh, um, was tough to deal with. Um, delay in his uh, consult to neuro-oncology and then the rush uh, to hospice, despite the fact that this man got another year uh, and uh, three months or so of life and good quality uh, life that I felt, I felt like he deserved to get you know, that opportunity to uh, come back and then make his own decision. So when I talk a little bit about treating leptomeningeal disease, it's not always the guarantee that we're going to extend their survival. It's my goal, of course, but extending a quality survival is one thing, but then returning somebody to a decisional capacity so that they can now make decisions and how the end of life looks. It is a tough situation. And we know that this is probably what's going to take them out. And the brain disease is going to outpace again, the body disease, but this will be especially due to the fact that they will not be allowed to be on uh, clinical trials. This last case that I wanted to present was especially interesting and frustrating at the same time to me because when I, and I just copied it, I just cut and pasted it right from the chart. Uh, basically, the first thing you notice is that they noted that she had these seizures and and that she had leptomeningeal enhancement and that there was an LP that showed malignant cells. My goodness, this is the gold standard for diagnosing leptomeningeal disease. And indeed, they say it here, but they said, you know, upon further evaluate, evaluation, she's found to have this, you know, in her brain, but 
nobody consulted me. Nobody uh, determined that this is a patient that needs to have um, uh, treatment. Indeed, uh, she was also on carbamazepine, which interferes with a lot of the chemotherapies uh, that we give. She was triple negative breast cancer at the time. And uh, uh, when they got that uh, second LP, they finally called me uh, on the second LP and said, okay, we really, really now believe this is a meningeal disease and it's not getting better with the systemic therapies that we're on. Uh, arguably, her systemic therapy was battling her AED. And um, that was also a problem. So by the time we got this full neuraxis image, you can see that there's disease up and down, you know, her spinal cord and the parenchyma and a lot of posterior fossa disease. So when they did the second LP, that's when they called me and I took that uh, tissue and sent it for an analysis with a company called Bioset that's since gone out of uh, business. And I now use a company called uh, Marini. Um, and that company does an amazing job, you know, with evaluating these tissues. So we were able to find, and I want you to see here that she had 67,000 detectable tumor cells in her CSF. This is with about six uh, cc's of uh, CSF and getting 70,000 or so of these cells. When I withdrew the fluid from her brain, it was the color of milk. And um, she, we were able to send that off for NGS testing. And indeed, uh, indeed, we found that she had an FGFR mutation. But most importantly, remember, she was triple negative. We detected a HER2 uh, new mutation, which opens her up for a lot of different treatments uh, systemically. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we sent her through, of course, whole brain radiation, a myo reservoir placement, and intrathecal chemotherapy with the HER2-directed uh, approach. You will see that in just one treatment uh, uh, of her uh, cancer or one, uh, I would say one or two treatments. I do those twice a week for somebody like her. I do it on Mondays and Thursdays, give it, give it about 72 hours in between. Uh, we were able to get that down to 6,000 of these cells. And what was interesting is I represented her case to her uh, primary doc. And I noticed that they had not started her on a HER2 directed therapy and they said, no, no, uh, looking at your own data here, it says that the HER2 is not detected. I said, that's after treatment. It was detected first before you know treatment was started. And he said, but now it's not detected. And I said, because I'm giving the intrathecal chemotherapy with HER2 directed uh, therapy, it has targeted those cells very effectively. So those cells are now being knocked down, but we need to stop those in the body. That... Um, discussion went on forever and they never um, started that. As a matter of fact, they started to uh, use the FGFR uh, approach and and her body disease was never retested to determine um, what we were, uh, to determine if she had her two positive uh, disease in the body. I can tell you the answer is yes. Those cells, when they finally find a way into the brain, they have to take on, well, they typically um, stay about the same, but some of these cells take on different mutations that allow them uh, to escape what's happening in the treatment in the body or it allows them to better survive in the brain, uh, which serves as a haven for them. But I was able to test uh, the CSF sequentially. And so draw number two, you were able to see that she got down uh, to just, I mean, uh, 6,000 cells. And you can see that by draw three, and each draw is a treatment. So I'm giving this medication for her twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. And so each draw, we can get that uh, fluid to come down uh, as far as how many cells are there. And then we sort of kind of wobble around here and you can, and I graph that out and you can see that at this blue line, <clears throat> we're starting to get issues and I don't know how to move this. I guess I do, but it's no good place to move it. But at least you'll see here for a second that she went to rehab for a while. And of course, I was able to notice that her, her disease started to increase. And then there was a drug holiday. And again, her disease starts to increase. And so the benefit of using a technology like this that Minerini um, uh, utilizes, it it's not just for the the diagnostic and the prognostic assessment, you know, we are, are targeting and use, using this data for targeting, but we can also use this to see how we 
how the residual disease looks and how well we're treating it. So it guides a uh, treatment decision-making for how frequently we need to do this. When I get a patient down to around this very low detectable, it probably wouldn't even be detected on MRI when the cells are this low, I am able to move this patient out to once a week, once every other week, and then once every um, every month, once every other month. And I have patients who have gone off of it and they're just on surveillance as far as intrathecal chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the issue in this particular case I want to talk a little bit about is there was a delay to recognizing that you had already recognized that there was leptomeningeal disease. And um, in this analysis paralysis period of let's just draw the one more time, I had to delay and take advantage of the second draw and then show them using the NGS uh, panel. There was a delay to consult, as of course, and some barriers with rehab and rehab wouldn't let her come in to get the IT treatment while she was there in rehab because they would have to pay for it. And then um, the uh, idea again of understanding that we had the data, we had everything, she was excluded from clinical trials, and the um, medical oncologist believing that there was no, or understanding that technology and understanding that the cells won't show up if they've been targeted heavily. And that uh, was a, kind of a frustrating period, but I wanted you guys to kind of see that particular case. The goal of treatment, as I mentioned before, is really to return people to their decisional capacity and disrupt this neurologic decline that they're on. And this lady was brought back to, and I, I remember her son was able to come in and watch some of the intrathecal chemotherapies. Uh, she was able to bring the family over, making all of her decisions, walking. Her husband was happy. You know, he commented that soon she'll be doing all the dishes again. And, you know, it, it just was a great opportunity to allow somebody to now make their own decisions about uh, end of life. So here's some of the metrics that we've been able to gather. So prior to the Omaya Clinic being developed, these patients, we could gather data to show that their median overall survival was about 20 weeks or so. We extended that in breast cancer to 116 weeks as a median overall survival. So 50% of patients were still alive. It's, an, it's the easiest uh, disease to treat, and that's why it's very tough to see these patients get overlooked. Um, melanoma is uh, difficult to treat, and it's really it's difficult to treat in general once it goes to the brain, uh, but we were able to double their median overall expectancy, unable to move the needle much on lung disease, mostly because of the fact that a lung uh, disease usually presents at the time. While breast cancer, you know, goes to the brain late, lung will go almost immediately. Um, so looking at, and this will be, you know, kind of a quick wrap up here because I would really love to talk uh, with you guys and see where things are and how interested people are in uh, some of the uh, next steps here. So um, this basically is five to 10% of cancer cases. It's not a very common disease, but when it does happen, four to six weeks is about the median expectation of survival. Um, if they're treated, and by treated, they mean maybe some radiation, maybe some systemic therapy. Uh, since, the, since the knowledge of lung cancer that is EGFR um, driven, osimertinib and medications that are known to uh, cross the blood-brain barrier have been utilized in uh, leptomeningeal disease or preventing people from having to get omayas. And uh, it, you, typically, I've seen some docs try to stop you from getting the whole brain radiation, which I don't think is a good idea. But osimertinib and these therapies that cross the blood-brain barrier have uh, been given a lot of, um, uh, have helped out with delaying some of the uh, flow of these cells into the brain. However, I don't think that it's the end all. I really do think that we have to meet the disease where it is in the brain. And I'm a big proponent for Omaya. And I can inject, like I said, seven different things into the Omaya. And uh, most often I'm doing dual uh, chemotherapy on the treatment days uh, with two different uh, therapies. So the incidence is only 38%. And uh, interesting study showed that 20 to 30% of people with known metastasis of their solid tumor that also have neurologic uh, symptoms were positive for uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis at uh, autopsy. It's mostly in um, these uh, solid tumors in breast, lung, and melanoma. About 4 to 25% of those will go on at leptomeningeal disease. 
it's three main compartments that this disease is found in, cerebral posterior fossa, and you get some cranial nerve uh, injury there, and then the spinal cords and roots. Uh, one third of these cases present with uh, the symptoms that are localized to a single compartment. A lot of times this is missed hydrocephalus or increased ICP in these patients uh, it has been found. And then, uh, but few people do the opening pressures anymore. A few people uh, recognize it. It's easier to see hydrocephalus on the MRI. Uh, very, very rarely. I've never met a person who ins who had incidental leptomeningeal um, uh, disease, but it, it is a rare finding. And I don't have to spend a lot of time here, but uh, understanding how there could be the perivascular uh, spread of uh, this uh, disease here. And then also he, we can have direct extension after surgery, or if it touches down from bone uh, and going into these uh, spaces. Um, when we look at the diagnosis here, uh, like we said, the gold standard is usually the CSF, but we understand that you can't really collect the CSF prior to doing an MRI uh, unless you run the risk of uh, making the MRI appear as though there is a diffuse uh, meningeal irritation. And so that could be a bit confusing. So CSF analysis, MRI in individuals. So the CSF analysis is typically uh, falsely negative. And so since that is always, you know, a lot of times it's negative because of the sensitivity to identify it, not using something like Minarini or Biosept, where, we look at, where we're looking at cell-free DNA and we're looking at fragments of cells and markers if you just send this under the microscope and you're trying to find it, it's pretty uh, difficult. And so you're you're going to a lot of time get a negative cytology. Now, looking at other portions of the CSF, and I'll show you on a subsequent slide, uh, there are ways that I've learned to be able to be more suspicious. MRI by itself isn't adequate. So uh, when we uh, I, I suspect leptomeningeal uh, dissemination of the disease uh, or or carcinomatous disease, we do an MRI of the full neuraxis. Uh, positive cytology, like I said, is the gold standard. And then a long, long time ago, Mike Glantz uh, determined that three successive LPs is where you get 90% accuracy. I say if you need to do more than one, you know, LP, it's just, it's barbaric, you know, at some point to me to just keep doing it. If we get evidence of, um, abnormal cells, you know, there. And so here's what I like to do. If the protein is high, which that tells me that there's something else there, it could be bacteria, yeah. Especially if the glucose is low, it tells me that something is chewing up the glucose. A problem that, you know, people have with interpreting the CSF is the, the CSF comes with the readout that says glucose is normal. Well, if the person's serum glucose is 300, uh, for whatever reason, maybe been on steroids, maybe diabetic, uh, then the CSF of the glucose would appear to be normal because it's high, or maybe it'll appear to be high. And a lot of people would say, then maybe this person does not have bacteria or neoplastic cells eating up the glucose in the fluid. The answer to that is, if it's less than 65% of whatever the serum is around the time that you collect the CSF, then it is indeed low. White blood cells going up, they're there to treat whatever problem in the way of neoplastic cells being there, uh, causing this protein breakdown and release of a lot of proteinaceous uh, uh, material that is picked up on the CSF. So when you get a high protein, a low glucose, a real low glucose, and high white blood cells, high opening pressure, this patient, in my opinion, would be at risk for uh, really the diagnosis of CSF, uh, I'm sorry, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. In this case, I would use a very sensitive technology like that described uh, before uh, to show, to do the NGS and really tell me how many cells are in there. We talk about this and I want to just kind of open this up for discussion. There is no clear good guideline on how to treat this. NCCN says once there's an inclusive diagnosis, definitely some radiation there. If that's going to be craniospinal, uh, that they have not landed on that uh, just yet. That's kind of something new that's uh, been proposed with protons. Uh, if there's involved field radiation, uh, meaning either the whole brain radiation itself or some targeted therapy to clear areas of spinal burden, 
um, those things are involved. And then they say, well, there could be some systemic therapies that you can use as long as they penetrate the blood brain barrier, but a combined modality using uh, the chemotherapy systemically with intrathecal therapy is often the case. Now, I personally deliver, like I said, uh, multiple different therapies into the CNS, but um, unfortunately, there we have not been able to land on what's a good dose of radiation. Um, five to 20 fractions, 20 to 40 gray. I typically, um, with these patients, like I said, do 10 to 20 uh, fr uh, gray in these patients and really in, in um, five to 10 fractions. And uh, with the help, of course, of the radiation oncologist, uh, the CSI, you know, with proteins, with protons, it, for me, is not a good option if it's a solid tumor. And especially in adults, we know the uh, huge number of uh, he, uh, GI and heme issues that happens with adults that are subjected to uh, CSI. And um, the idea that it's not recommended, and I've spoken with several uh, neuro-oncologists that are uh, commonly treating leptomeningeal disease, and many of them would say the same thing, that if this is a solid tumor, you know, not likely. If it's a hematologic malignancy, yes. If it's palliative, yes. If there's a heavy burden of disease in the spinal cord, up and down the spinal cord, and this person just doesn't have a good opportunity, and I mean bulky disease uh, to live, then that's what I would do. Uh, in a lot of these patients, if there's just that layer, that smooth coat around the spinal cord up and down, it may look scary, but if you treat the CSF, if you treat the fluid and inject the chemo at the right dose and frequency, you will get that dis that uh, disease treated around the uh, uh, the spinal cord. Uh, this paper came out. I think uh, Adam and I had a Adam. You may have noticed that we didn't get much uh, in the way of a response, but I remember that we had uh, a big issue where I the a patient that had come in at at Geisinger had hydrocephalus and they, and she had leptomeningeal disease. And I said, okay, here's what we need to do. Let's hurry up and do the whole brain radiation treatment. I can take some fluid off here and there uh, if and then get the Omaya placed and we'll keep on trying to get this hydrocephalus under control. I understand the urgency, especially from a neurosurgical standpoint to uh, get this patient an EVD or to try to get this hydrocephalus under control. Uh, before I was able to intervene and get the whole brain radiation started, uh, the next morning when we came in, neurosurgery had already placed a, an EVD. The EVD, of course, you know, uh, draining out the fluid and the patient started to come around and they were very happy about that. The family got the immediate response of, oh my gosh, thank goodness you know, she's doing, she's looking a little better. Well, for for the next three days, I'm in a battle with a uh, neurosurgery about we need to, you know, you could take this and make this into an Omaya. And so I can start to treat the disease because what's happening here is the neoplastic cells are blocking the CSF outflow tracks and I need to start to treat the disease. And they're like, but no, the minute you take this EVD out, she's going to, um, herniate and it'll be two days to live. And the family was very upset and very, you know, concerned about what to do. And I said, no matter what, we're not treating the disease and you're pumping it off and dumping some of it into this container next to the bed. But fact is, is that we're not treating the disease. So he said, we'll put her back on systemic therapy. And I said, well, the systemic therapy is not going to get into the brain. They said, well, then inject some of your IT chemotherapy in through this EVD. And I said, well, then it's going to drain and now you'll have chemo and the cells into the container next to the bed. And so um, it really it really was a very frustrating period. But they said, then why don't we just clamp off the EVD, you know, for a period? And I said, well, the, the intrathecal chemotherapy has to sit for 72 hours, you know, inside this fluid to start to treat and to get up and down the spinal cord. And so if you can clamp it off for 72 hours and she doesn't die, then you can take it out, place no Maya, allow me to have something that allows it to be treated in the in the brain and that it stays there for the neat amount of time it needs to stay. And I would agree to keep drawing the fluid off of this particular patient. And uh, so ultimately, I was able to convince the family that we were um, 
that let's go ahead and place the Omaya doctor. Uh, and, and I worried about doing a, um, a VP shine as well, because that was an offer. But unfortunately, uh, I was worried about if there was no evidence of disease in the body just yet, and we know that she needs to be on systemic therapy. Once you start pumping this high amount of disease out of the brain into the peritoneum, you're going to get, you know, this risk for uh, worsening uh, disease. And then again, every time I give a chemotherapy, it's going to be pumped, you know, out of uh, the uh, brain into the peritoneum. And so we we just, you know, went back and forth for a long time. Finally, um, uh, Adam stepped in and decided to go ahead and place the Omaya for me. And uh, this was probably the beginning of a great relationship with how to treat uh, these patients and how to do these, you know, Maya's I eventually the, uh, the, the newer uh, neurosurgeon who had started and was very keen on keeping the EVD and uh, allowed Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Sarkar to step in and just do the Omaya. And when we treated this patient with Omaya within about a week, she was already doing better and we didn't have to continue to pump you know, fluid off of the uh, Omaya. So I thought that was interesting. A new paper that came out talks about using an on-off switch, on-off valve. And so that would be the same as sort of clamping it off. I thought it was interesting. This paper was published. It came out of uh, MD Anderson, uh, Houston. And I was shocked that their overall finding was that, yes, the symptoms improved with the VPS. That should happen. And there was ease in delivery of the IT chemotherapy while you use the on and off valve there. But what they noted was that there was increased overall survival if you gave intrathecal therapy versus no intrathecal chemotherapy if you have the shunt. So the shunt was in place both times and they said, but you live longer if you give IT chemo. Uh, yeah, so that was that was another one that was uh, interesting to just read about. And I think I, I just sent that to uh, Adam and I. We were kind of talking uh, with the group at um, at a uh, Geisinger. I just made a group text, and Adam and I kind of looked at that and thought it was interesting. Adam, I think at one point you did a uh, inline uh, VP shunt with an Omaya uh, for a patient. That was a, another unique situation where it wasn't leptomeningeal carcinomatous disease. It was more. Uh, the patient had um um he had a fungal infection and the yeah. fungal yeah, yeah. We, we did that, Natasha. We did a lot of things that were a little bit more on the uh, uh limits of what would uh, normally be practiced because I think we were just trying to help folks with what you're showing to us is really dismal disease. But let it's me good. let you finish up, and then there are going to be some questions if you don't mind. Yeah, perfect. And actually, this is these are uh, toward the end here. But yeah, that that situation with the inline Amaya was really very interesting because this patient had crypto and same issue where the CSF outflow tracks were being blocked. But I wasn't worried about shunting something into the belly. You know, this patient was on systemic therapy. So the Omaya was a beautiful way for us to test uh, and do everything. So here, this was just a paper that I, I know some people will be interested in the CSI. Uh, the long and short of it is that uh, people agree that it's only indicated in that patient who is has a great performance status. Uh, there is uh, the disease is controlled in the body, and then there are effective systemic options for treatment. But again, a lot of people don't like to use this. It's not. It, it's, it is. You do have a great deal of toxicity, and it hasn't been shown really to have an overall improved survival that is a quality survival. There are some clinical trials going on right now that help with evaluating leptomeningeal disease, but they are very, very slow to accrue uh, over time. So in summary, I really don't even have to you know, uh, summarize much. Is that I really would like to hear what people have to ask about this or what people have to say. So I know there's some questions in the chat. Hey, uh, so Natasha, uh... Thank you, first of all, so much for taking the time and, and helping us uh, understand a really complex disease, which is leptomeningeal disease. Now, I think you've given us some opportunity to imagine that there's uh, some hope for treating it, but I think the biggest barrier to treatment is probably the primary or the, the care provider team that may look at this and say, well, this is just futile and uh, nothing good will come of this. Um, and you've sort of highlighted that in some of your uh, examples. So 
what would be your thoughts to leave with us? I mean, when, in, you know, Dr. Rami is also on, uh, when we were in our training, probably if somebody had leptomeningeal disease, we'd say that there was only two to three months of survival, maybe four. With the things that you pointed out to us, what do you think? Do you think that we're all being short-sighted in our willing to be aggressive in their disease or, or, or that's yeah. about right, but we can give them better quality of life while they're still here? Yeah. And so it's a great question. I think that we ne never promising that you're going to, you know, do something amazing with intrathecal chemotherapy is most important. What I start off with, if we get more life and we get more quality of life, that's great. But the goal is how can I stop these seizures, return this person to decisional capacity so that they can make their own decision. You recall that we were able to extend the median overall survival in breast cancer from 20 weeks to 116 weeks. There is something to do, but it's being as aggressive as the tumor, meeting the tumor where it is in the brain is a very real option. Omias have been available for 50 years. And so the fact that we can use something and now deliver, I can deliver immunotherapy. Uh, we can deliver three types of, uh, uh, well, so we can deliver um, immune, uh, rituxan, which is a monoclonal antibody, uh, steroids, and then we can deliver her two two types of her two directed therapies. We can deliver topoisomerase inhibitors. There's so many different types of uh, therapies that we can deliver for breast melanoma and lung patients. Methotrexate is always a backbone um, for all of the therapy that I use. So I, as I mentioned before, there's dual therapies that we can do for these patients, and methotrexate would be the backbone, and then I would add in whatever targeted therapy uh, that's appropriate. Doctor. Um, a glitz uh, at uh, MD Anderson in Houston was one of the first people to get uh, nivolumab approved as a dual therapy to be giving systemic uh, as well as intrathecal. And I've been able to give that to patients based on her protocol. And we know that that's now something else that we can do. So meeting these, and I have never in the course of treating any of these leptomeningeal disease patients, 182 of them now, uh, which is enough now to publish this series and show that since nobody that was on systemic therapy and on a regular treatment schedule has died of leptomeningeal spread of their disease, if you're still on the treatment strategy, uh, that we can show that these patients are ideal to go on to clinical trials. So Natasha, um, you, you talked to us about how you know breast and lung and melanoma tend to be the, the ones that uh, produce leptomeningeal disease. Those are kind of like, at least the first two are the big three for METs to the brain. Um, so not maybe too surprising. And then you gave us a figure, was it about 5% uh, say uh, that'll give leptomeningeal uh, disease? Yeah, so uh, five to 25%, it's mostly- Sure, sure, a wide the, range. But, but I guess the question is, do you have a sense of, in what patients should we be more concerned and more vigilant about uh, their their headache or their back pain might be yeah. neural traction? And we should really be looking at this because you pointed out that, you know, LPs are often ineffective um, and that's true. MRIs may just be at the subtle stage. Um, so which patients should we really have a yeah. high register of suspicion? So 65% of anybody with a systemic cancer uh, will have some CNS involvement, whether that is, or peripheral nervous system involvement, whether that is a neuropathy or that's going to be disease actually going into that uh, CNS or PNS space. So I say, why worry about the headache? Why wonder if this back pain is anything? Get a neuro-oncologist involved. Mm -hmm. uh, I just started here at Indiana and I'm working remote until July, but the first thing that I found was that the neuro-oncologists there don't deal with the Mets. They no. don't deal with the Mets and they, and, I, and they don't do any cancer neurology. Cancer neurology is really just the treatment, the neurologic treatment uh, of complications that are due to cancer or cancer therapy. So when I started, the first thing I said was, show me all the medical oncologists. I would like to be on your tumor board once so that I can say, I do cancer neurology. If you have a numb toe or a dizzy patient, just send them to me because yeah. I know that one day they're going to be the one um, that has a disease spread. So like you said, 
the interesting uh, figure was that 20 to 30% of people that had a neurologic sign or symptom with metastatic body disease was found on autopsy to have leptomeningia. Yeah, well, I saw you said but quite, it happens. Um, yeah. yeah, quite a lot. It, do you make a distinction between, you know, the supratentorial space and the spine? Because if you say that, okay, you have leptomeningeal disease in your brain, why should there not be leptomeningeal disease in the spine? And then if that's the case, because you also pointed out between whole brain radiation and then craniospinal radiation, and I'm sure craniospinal radiation must just kick their butts. Yeah, it, it does. And so whenever you say you have leptomeningeal disease, that is in all the fluid spaces, you know, from the lumbar cistern up, you know, to, uh, to the uh, spaces in the brain. So I assume that it's everywhere. Now, when you talk about aiming radiation at something, yeah. it has to be bulky in the in the spine for me. That coating along the spine doesn't yeah. bother me because that coating, the CSF treatment can penetrate three millimeters uh, into the tissue. And so if I'm also getting uh, systemic therapy, which can also mm -hmm. hit anything that's uh, before it crosses that blood brain barrier. So systemic therapy combined with the intrathecal treats it up and down the spinal cord. So I feel like, and even the radiation, focusing that radiation at the whole brain, we're over multiple days, five to 10 fractions. We're hoping that as these cells circulate up and down the spinal cord, we're getting that, we're hitting a lot of those cells. That by itself can hold the disease for, my experience has been up to about six weeks. So that's why as soon as the radiation is done, I have somebody like you placing the Omaya immediately, same, next day after the radiation finishes, and then you know moving forward with the uh, intrathecal chemotherapy the day after that. But then I guess what I would ask is, um, it sounds like these patients come to the hospital sick. It sounds like the radiation in your protocol should be done up front. Uh, it sounds like then they should get their intrathecal therapy, whether it's just through a single first lumbar puncture or then ultimately through an Amaya. Mm -hmm. But are these patients so sick that does this highlight the fact that they really need to be at a tertiary care or quaternary care center where their care is actually in-house? Or are you saying that, you know, they're still going home for their two weeks of five days a week uh, radiation, and then they're seeing you uh, in the outpatient clinic uh, every other day for their uh, Omaya? or Because I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, right. I would think that these are very ill patients. They're very sick. And the ones that come in, of course, in status, I don't let them leave and be, I push for them to be able to stay for at least the five fractions of radiation. Um, mm -hmm. That's when they're really very sick. If they're fine enough to get 10 fractions, uh, then those are people that will come in and out. But I have to be work very carefully to make sure that they're planning with the neurosurgeon to get the Omaya immediately after the radiation finishes. The day that they stay overnight uh, with the Omaya placement, I go ahead and give them their first dose of intrathecal chemotherapy. Every other dose after that it happens in the outpatient setting. The only struggle I have is making sure they don't end up in a rehab that won't okay. allow them to come back and forth. Yeah, so, but yeah, they, they should be treated. But some of these patients are doing okay. Leptomeningeal disease, once you identify it because of a cranial nerve finding, a numb chin, a facial numbness or droop, those kinds of things are tinnitus, ringing in the ear, being off balance. Those things I can, as long as I can convince the radiation oncologist and the neurosurgeon to time things, to get things going right away, you can catch it before they fall off. But the minute they go downhill, it's because the disease has blown up and it's really hard to convince the family, especially if they get somebody coming in like, oh boy, this is terrible. Your disease is, is terrible. And if nobody will treat the systemic disease, you can convince the family that that person looks bad enough to let them go. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I think that's what you point out. That's the, the challenge that we have is just basically in the providers at say the level that are maybe maybe some oncologists, but are certainly maybe at the level when they're not oncologists, it's just a, a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Yeah, somebody, uh, Dr. Risco left a question in the uh, chat that says, any general strategies for how to best work with the medonks and other, I tell you what, the best thing that I have found is to just show them, I can show you better than I can tell you. When you bring one of these patients up from, you know, what would have been the dead and the pain, 
family has already signed the, uh, okay, let's go ahead and go hospice. And I'm like, well, if you want hospice, how about this? Let's just try this on the way to hospice. And we're able to see a very nice response. So do you have a good resource that describes the flow cytometry um, testing to increase our diagnostic yield? So flow cytometry is only useful in like hematologic malignancies. The cytology, you know, is what we use for solid tumors. So if it's a leukemia, the flow will pick those up and kind of identify those cells. I hope that uh, answers that question. And so there's a lot of data on using the flow for those, but leukemic, uh, those are very, those are rare, leukemic and lymphoma, CSF. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's almost fun. It, not funny, that, that's a word, the wrong word, but where you have lymphoma that does spread throughout the CNS axis as primary CNS lymphoma. It's very rare though, you're right, that it ends up as leptomeningeal, which yeah. is almost a dichotomy for me, or maybe because it's so rapidly treated with steroids or yeah. or, or however that we just ne never give it a chance to really yeah. express itself. And a lot of the drugs that they use penetrate the blood brain very beautifully, methotrexate. Yeah, sure, sure. Kind of sure. So there is there is a way to handle that. That's true. <laughs> well, Natasha, it's almost the hour's almost up. You can either go back to sleep or get your first cup of coffee uh, in Arizona. We're going to wish you the best of luck and success in Indiana. And thank you again for always being a part of our tumor boards. I think you really uh, provide a richness that's uh, that's remarkable and we all appreciate. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, please uh, uh, express with me my appreciation to Dr. Gatson. And like I said, good luck in Indiana. Welcome yeah, thank you. Well, I'll be on the same time schedule as you guys. So I'll be able to join uh, the meetings more, you know, even more. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Adam. And I look forward to talking to you after this about um, the symposium that I want to bring there to Pennsylvania. And I would love to have you guys help me. It's separate from uh, what I do with Indiana, but I want to do a symposium that's patient facing there. And hopefully, we'll, we'll be more than happy to help. Thanks, Natasha. Take care. And bye, everyone. Have a good weekend.